Well, a couple of stocks continue to lose ground. So we have Aisha Motors, which is down six and a half odd percent, uh, low point of the day for that one. M and M also, which is down around three point seven percent, and a lot of these steel stocks have been weak on fears of a global growth slowdown. So JSW Steel, Hindalco, Tata Steel, all of these stocks are down anywhere between two to three odd percent. But it is the start of a new year, and we have all of the asset classes which continue to be in focus. Prashant is here to provide us with a snap snapshot of how exactly various asset classes across equities and commodities as well as uh, in the money market are placed and the key levels to watch out for there. Prashant, over to you. Well, I thought it would be a good idea to actually look at, uh, you know, uh, stocks, uh, currencies, oil. Uh, I mean, actually, the only thing I'm not looking at is yields and especially U.S. yields. But I think uh, uh, what I'm going to put out gives us a fair idea of where financial markets are really poised at. Let's start straight away. Let's dive in to the one uh, sort of value which is probably watched the most uh, uh, closely around the world for equities, which is the S&P 500. Now, the S&P 500 is actually... It touched and bounced off the 200-week moving average, which was 2,350. 2,350 was that level. And we've kind of bounced off it. We've had one other instance of the S&P 500 coming very close to the 200-weekly moving average. This was two years ago. And from there, I mean, the market doing very, very well. Let's see if we see a repetition of that. But, I mean, the fact is, it looks like, tentatively, fingers crossed, uh, maybe the worst for now, is behind us. I mean, there has been a touch and a bounce off the 200-week moving average. Let's come to the Asian equity spec. I mean, generally speaking, I mean, before I get to, I'm uh, talking about two specific indices, Hang Seng and Nikkei. Uh, generally speaking, Asian equities have done pretty well uh, in the last quarter, Q4 of calendar 2018, when you contrast that to the sell-down that we saw in U.S. markets. So the Hang Seng, for example, remains around or just above the 200-weekly moving average, which is, again... I mean, uh, you could call it the big Lakshman Rekha. Uh, and the same indicator I was looking at for the S&P 500 as well. The Nikkei seems to be, I mean, the big market, the Japanese market seems to be in a bit more trouble. Uh, it's uh, still below the double top neckline of about 20,347. And it needs to at least come up above this uh, on a, maybe a weekly basis for some confidence to return. Uh, you know, you can talk about India as well, but I mean, India is actually an outlier. Uh, India is perhaps uh, the only big uh, global equity market, maybe apart from Brazil, which actually uh, returned uh, positive for 2018. So I'm not going into India at this stage. Let's move on. Uh, let's uh, look at the. Uh, let, let's look at oil. Uh, it's uh, it crashed, uh, and maybe you know that the last leg of a crash in oil prices wasn't too much expected, but it's showing indecision at the lows. No real uh, sign of what it's likely to do. Uh, it needs to bounce, I mean, and maybe on a weekly basis. So I think that will be watched pretty closely. So no real directional kind of cue here uh, or even levels nearby as far as oil is concerned. The dollar index, well, it's testing the double top neckline at 96.04. Uh, so it needs to hold that. But generally speaking, I mean, if you look at not just the dollar index, but uh, the dollar against a variety of other currencies, the dollar is looking, I mean, the setups are looking weak. I mean, essentially, the dollar is looking weak against most currencies. Look at the USD INR, for example. It's on the 200-day moving average at about 69.27. And, uh, you know, the next support levels for the dollar come in at about 68.78, 68.86. So, uh, I mean, watch this uh, uh, carefully. Uh, but as I said, across the board, the dollar setups are, are looking a little weakish. So that's where we find ourselves at. Equities, I would say, a bit more constructive after the sell-down meltdown we saw, especially in the US. Asia has been doing better. Oil, not really decided. But I mean, you know, you'd find supporters for stronger oil and weaker oil, those who want equity markets to be stronger. So we'll see how that one goes. And currencies are generally more subdued kind of dollar, which isn't bad news for emerging markets. Back to you. Okay, all right, Prashant. Thanks very much for that. But let's take one section of that entire... Uh, link forward and that is basically commodities. Manisha Gupta joins in to tell us what she's tracking within that space and some opinion as well. Manisha. Thank you so much for that, Ekta. Well, the metal space is on radar, especially after the Chinese data that has come in yesterday and the first economic data of this year and that has come in on the negative side. We have seen the factory orders contracting for the first time in 19 months and that doesn't augur well for the risk appetite. So you have seen the metal prices on LME start with a decline and we have seen 
copper. Nickel price is down by nearly quarter to half a percent as we trade onto the first trading day of this year. Well, remember, it is about the weak economic data, the slowdown in China, the U.S. and China trade concerns, Brexit. There have been a lot of factors which actually have continued to weigh onto the metals, which have put in the first negative year since 2015, down by nearly 12 to 25 percent, depending on what metal you were really watching out for. And that's exactly on the same note that we have started 2019 as well. But Paul Bartholomew, Senior Managing Editor at S&P Global Platts, now joins us with his sense on the metal space. Paul, hi. A very happy new year to you. How have you begun uh, the new year uh, on the note for metals, really, because uh, the China data yet again on a weaker side? Yes, thanks. Happy new year to you, too. Um, yeah, um, the manufacturing data was a, was a bit of a, well, a, a, a small surprise, I guess. It was, all, it was really um, starting to deteriorate towards the end of um, last year. Um, but I think, it, you know, it, it really just kind of, um, you know, I think in a way sort of formalizes the, the, the slightly uh, weak state of the Chinese economy and also shows that the, the drag on, um, on some of the manu uh, on the um, consumer driven segments really and how how they're going to sort of impact um, metals prices so i think yeah the first first quarter or the first couple of months are, are, are looking a, a bit jittery definitely hmm. uh, what is more bearish in the whole pack when you look at that because uh, you know a few people that we have been talking to do say that steel demand especially for india will continue to grow at a 7 to 8% annually uh, the demand expects expected to be on the higher side as well the chinese winter curbs perhaps would yet again support the prices here yeah, I mean, you know, those are the fundamentals. I think the fundamentals for for, for India are probably um, a, a bit more certain um, mm -hmm. at the moment. Uh, there seems to be kind of less of this kind of background noise swirling around, like you're getting with the, you know, with China and uh, and, and the US, and obviously with the, with the Indian um, election not far away. There, there should be sort of pl plenty of um, investment and activity in the next few months. So yeah, we see steel demand growth definitely. You know sort of six to eight percent, uh, you know, in, in coming years. I think in China, there, there are two things really to look out for this year. You know, what, what's going to happen with the relationship with the U.S. And there's a, there's a meeting coming up um, in Beijing, um, which should, should provide a bit more clarity. And also, you know, we're going to have to see some stimulus from the Chinese government to, to, to get things uh, up, up and running. I mean, what's a little bit of a concern, I think, is that they're Beijing is talking about um, putting stimulus into property, you know, which is one of the sort of sectors that's been trying to take the heat out of. So it doesn't really need more stimulus, but I think it just sort of shows uh, a little bit of desperation um, to get the, the economy sort of up and running again. Hmm. Paul, I remember 2018 when we started, we began with two themes, infrastructure and the EV demand for metals. 2019 seems to be beginning with the stimulus measures and concerns about uh, within the U.S. and China trade uh, conversation. Uh, how different is the beginning for the two years? And from here on, what are the major things that you will keep an eye on? Um, well, everything was sort of ticking along quite nicely till you know till around the sort of end of end of uh, August. It was really the last quarter, the last um, you know third of 2018 where things started to, to go downhill. And that wasn't sort of necessarily to do with, with the tariff situation because the tariffs were introduced, uh, you know, a lot earlier back in sort of March, April time. And even though sentiment was, was a bit dented at the time, the fundamentals in China were still fairly solid. Mm. It's, really the, it's really the fundamentals coming off to such an extent, I think, that surprised everybody. And I think a lot of that was to do with the Chinese government trying to sort of, um, you know, address debt, attack, um, attack shadow banking, is tightening up its credit lines and, and liquidity. And I think the economy just slowed a lot more than it was expecting. So now it's having to, uh, you know, put stimulus back into the system and try and sort of, you know, crank up back up through the gears um, to get things moving. So I think, obviously, the, you know, the U.S.-China situation is, is one to watch um, this year, but also, sure. um, you know, the, the, just the sort of underlying strength of the, of the Chinese economy and to what extent, you know, Beijing is going to uh, the kind of things it's going to do to, um, you know, to, to stimulate growth again. Mm -hmm. Paul, one final question. While most uh, uh, experts, analysts, of course, are not so bullish on the metal space, but a couple of them still stand steel, as I mentioned, and the uh, other couple really are copper and nickel. Anything that is your favorite really among the pack that you see, will, you think will see more support? 
Um, I mean, I think they're all going to be sort of impacted by the whole, by sort of the you know, geopolitical factors and macroeconomic factors. Mm. Um, you, know, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll get a bit more said. I think, you know, all, all of the different metals have, have different uh, things going on, you know, with aluminium, with, with the, you know, Roussel um, potentially sort of coming back um, on the supply side of things. Uh, you know, with copper, there's a little bit more supply this year. I think than people were expected, so there'll be sort of less of a, a supply deficit. But I think it, you know, should be reasonably well supported. But I think um, you know, all, all of the metals are going to be impacted by you know by the same thing until we know we get a clearer sense of direction where China's heading, what's what the, its relationships like with the U.S. I think you know there, there's always that sense people are a little bit reluctant to kind of invest and they'll sort of sit on the sidelines until we get a bit more a bit more clarity about the, the you know the macroeconomic environment point taken paul thank you so much for joining us with that so clearly that's the view coming in from snp global plats as well the next couple of months is still on the weaker side no buying calls really coming in for the sector Yes, absolutely, Manisha. I just want to point out that, in fact, CLSA has downgraded the entire metal space as well. They've cut the FI 2021 EPS for Indian metal companies anywhere between 9 to 38 odd percent. Tata Steel downgraded to sell from buy. JSW Steel downgraded to sell from underperform. Hindalco also to sell from underperform. So that's another reason why you're seeing all of these stocks lower in today's trade.